Welcome back to The Move, where we are vibing with the book at least 10 minutes at a time. And the next 10 minutes, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, 1 through 5. Nighttime edition. Yeah. People might notice the, there's no sun coming from, from the windows today. We, we've had busy lives, busy days, and this is the only time we could sneak in a <laughs> podcast of The Move at 8.45. It's been a long work on day. On a Tuesday night. <laughs> so Glad to be here, though. Glad Always a privilege. be here. So, so Hebrews, Hebrews. Yeah, we were going to do two episodes on this chapter. Decided to turn it into three, maybe even four. We'll see how it, how things pan out. But that's because there it's a it's a pretty dense section. Uh, there's a lot happening right here. Yeah, and what's interesting is that uh, I find this to be very much a part of the way Paul writes. Um, another reason why I think it's probably Paul um, is that Paul will give a theological treatise, right, mm -hmm. to finally get to the meat where we don't think the meat would be interesting excuse me i'll give you an example in the book of romans the book of romans is not about romans five through eight we like to focus there we a lot love to focus there <laughs> oh my goodness we love to focus there a lot for obvious reasons sure I'm trying to get some truths about the gospel but the book of romans was not written as a systematic theology it was written as a letter that was occasioned by some sort of event or a social situation that was transpiring so the the way you would uh, designate this letter. It's an occasional letter. There's an hmm. occasion as to why it's written. And it is written because Paul is urging certain people to get along, the weak and the strong, in Romans 12 through 15. Sure. So that the point that the letter is written is to deal with the dynamics of this church that has these this strong faction and this weak faction and how to get along with one another. The reason Paul gives the theological treatise is to actually socially proof and validate that he is somebody worth listening to and that his hmm. gospel is what it is. And the crux of what he's saying is actually built upon this theology because hmm. the crux of what he's saying is actually Romans 12 through 15 while being built on this theological point. It would be like at a wedding. The homily is an occasional message. Yep. It's important sure yep. it's reflecting something true sure yeah. it's apropos for the moment sure but yep. that's not the point not the of moment. the wedding the point of the wedding is that moment where two become one yes but what god has joined together let no one uh separate yes the homily is cool great but the homily just leads to the impact of that one yep. singular moment where two become one so that moment is dripping with meaning and significance and weight and importance because the homily has framed it. Mm. The homily has done a framing, whether it be theological, sociological, f uh, philosophical, maybe sprinkled in with a little bit of humor. Mm -hmm. Those are some good homilies. Yeah. But then the moment of the exchange of the vows, the commitment of one life to another, and then sealed with a kiss, that is what we're all really there for. Mm. But the homily frames it in such a way that that moment becomes weighty. Right? That's exciting because then it, if, if you've been through all the 30 odd episodes that have led us to Hebrews 13, you're like, I don't know that I picked up all the pieces quite yet. I might have to listen to the whole season again. Well, yeah. hey, listen to the whole season again. Do it. Don't, don't, stop, don't let me stop you. Yeah. But even if you have missed some of the pieces along the way, this is the point. And this is the point. Let brotherly love continue. Mm. And it's brotherly love rooted and grounded in Jesus, right? So he's speaking to these Jews who he doesn't want these Jews to leave their brotherly affection that they've come to know and grow in because of Jesus, right? Mm. So look at verse two. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So brotherly love continues. Don't neglect hospitality. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body, right? So it's about a life being lived under the Lordship of Christ. And it's a life that looks a particular way. It hospitable, hmm. brotherly love hmm. continues. Mm -hmm. It sides with the marginalized, the imprisoned, the oppressed. It, it, it meets them in that place. And those are of the body, you know, sure. members of the body that are now suffering, right? Verse four, marriage is held in honor among all. The marriage bed is uh, undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral. And then, uh, oh, it's actually, um, well, let's keep reading. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Mm -hmm. Notice how his quotation of, uh, of, of 
Psalm 118.6 is directly connected back to Hebrews 12. Hmm. Hebrews 12, if you remember, verse 3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Hmm. So you're supposed to consider Jesus so you don't grow weary or faint-hearted. Now look at verse 6. What then do we say as we continue in this journey of holding fast to the confession of this high priest who is Jesus? Hmm. We say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And as we hmm. journey, what do we do? We let brotherly love continue. We show hospitality. We keep the marriage bed pure. We align ourselves with those of the body who are suffering, right? Hmm. We keep our lives free and undefiled from the love of money, being content with what we have, living these simple, God-fearing lives, because fundamentally we're committed to the truth that Jesus Christ is, in fact, Lord. Hmm. So we don't let go of the life of faith, right? Hmm. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, what is the life of faith? What does it look like? Well, let me start with Hebrews chapter 1, <laughs> take you all the way to 12, so that then I can ultimately tell you, so in light of all of this, let brotherly love continue. Yeah. You yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I have a, a sense as to how the first couple of verses would apply to my life, the idea of brotherly love, uh, hospitality, uh, the marriage bed, you know, the love of money. These things make sense to me. How does the verse of what can man do to me and the idea of actually being afraid of that prevent one from doing those things well. Oh yeah, the, this this idea of the fear of man, if mm -hmm. I'm hearing you right, yep. right? Where fear is the psychological terror of impending doom. Sure. Right? So you have a psychological uh, phenomenon that occurs that actually manifests itself physiologically Right. Mm -hmm. And it's because you sense threat or some sort of impending doom. And then you chorus, you, you respond and react in such a way as to secure that which you're afraid of losing. Hmm. Right. And usually the the way that's cashed out, the way the sum total of that is that then you give yourself over to sensual living because hmm. you're living through the senses of trying to retain something you fear of losing in the natural. Right? So if I'm afraid, if I live from scarcity, this idea of fear of what man can do to me, I'm afraid that that person might somehow take something meaningful from me, which would cause me to be uh, somewhat uh, reserved in my generosity to strangers. Yeah, because I am not just freely giving from an overflow I'm actually giving something that I need. And hmm. if I give you something, then how do I actually have something, right? Because my the resource that I'm giving you is the object of confidence that uh, I place my trust in to actually satisfy any present need, hmm. as opposed to feeling the receiving the instruction of the Holy Spirit at any given moment, if he asks you to be generous in some capacity, you give generously grounded in a confidence that this generosity is flowing from abundance. It's not flowing from scarcity so that I'm not being generous in order to be tested to see whether or not I can actually suffer with going three or four meals for the sake of God. And now I'm fasting and praying to strengthen my spiritual man. No, what if it's God has resources he wants to actually spill out to other people. And mm. you're the conduit because you know that you have a good father who's always given in abundance. And since you are no longer living from fear of what man can do to you, you can actually give away money or be generous or, you know, give freely. Why? Because you're rooted in a confidence that the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What mm. can man do to me? The Lord yeah. is my helper. I will not fear. What will not having a few dollars in my pocket do to me? Right. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What will me enduring somebody's offense say about who I am? Like, the Lord mm. is my helper. I am not that offensive comment that you've, you know, levied it my way or lobbed my way. Uh, the Lord is my helper. I am not subject to scarcity simply because my bank account is low. And even in the presence of it, he's asking me to give. Mm. Right? The Lord is my helper. I am not subject to to not walking confidently and victorious simply because you're threatening my livelihood mm -hmm. and life, right? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. Lord is my helper. And so I will not move apart from the confidence that the Lord is my helper. And because I won't be moved, my life will look like this. I will continue in brotherly affection. 
I will continue to be hospitable to people. I will keep my marriage bed undefiled. I will not become a lover of money, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to count the cost, see the end, and continue to claim the Lord as my helper. Now, you might ask, who is this Lord? Well, I'll take you back to chapter one. Yeah. At sundry times and at many ways. (laughs) (laughs) The Lord reveals himself. Yeah, yeah, through the prophets. So I think this is the crux of it. This is where we're headed. It's like, hold on. It's it's interesting how there's a lot of really fun ways to talk about the big picture, the metaphysical, the theological, the philosophical, but it it often re- does return back to the kind of simple truth of like love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, and why? Because the Lord has demonstrated His faithfulness and His goodness. So just, and I love verse seven. We might have to actually extend this to verse. Oh, seven okay, we already went past right? one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. I mean, look at this. It says, "Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Hmm. Think about that." Yeah, because th- that's a that's a bold claim. Check out the receipts. Check out how my life has been turning out. And if this is Paul in one sense, hasn't turned out very good. My man. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, he's so, been shipwrecked, he's been flogged, he's been stoned, he's been imprisoned, he's been all kinds of different things. And it's like, you know, my life's dope, yo, check it out. It's like, oh. That's, that's, that right there is a framing of the American Western mind when yeah. it comes to Christianity. That somehow if we follow these principles, it'll work. Our life is actually going to work. I take this verse in the light of, listen, mm. remember your leaders. Who spoke to you? The Lord's your helper? Cool. Now remember your leaders. Jesus is one of those leaders. Right. Ends up on a cross. Look at Paul. Look at Peter. Look at John. Look at James. What is it? Like all the disciples end up martyred in some meaningful sense? Take a look at your leaders, right? Consider the outcome of their way of life, right? Hmm. And imitate their faith. It's a sober... That's a very... so Yeah. Because it's not like it works, therefore you would want to do it. It's like, listen... They're so committed to the point of death, to the point of giving up of themselves completely. This is what it looks like to remain in the thing. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to build a tower, consider the cost. Right. And listen, we're telling you this is the best thing. Yeah. Because Jesus is Lord. Mm. And what I've said from chapter 1 to verse 12 absolutely holds true. So since it holds true, consider and count the cost of where this is headed. Hmm. We encourage you to go this route, but we want you to know where this route leads. Interesting. Right? This is like Jesus saying, uh, what is it? Uh, anyone who lives godly will... Su- Maybe this wasn't Jesus. This is later New Testament. Uh, was it Timothy? Anyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus does suffer persecution oh, yeah. is the idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, I mean, think about, think about the early church, right? Uh, and think about the place where so many Christians ended up mm-hmm. in the early Roman Empire. Nobody was building mega churches. Nobody was applying biblical principles to business and reaping rewards. Sure. Right? It wasn't, you know, a three-point sermon on your best life now. Mm-hmm. No, it was, there was a fruit that was godliness and sanctification for the joy of knowing him, for the joy of having been set free from sin in a very real transformative way so that your mind was renewed, your heart was made new, like you had confidence and and you had a change of life from the inside. You were made clean and you had an experience with the Lord and the call from your leaders were, you know what it's like to walk with the Lord. Don't remove that confidence. Consider our lives and look at where it's ended up. We are now at the stake in the middle of the Colosseum, right? Lions have eaten us mm. up. They burned us on stakes, right? Mm-hmm. This is literally what he said in Hebrews chapter 11 mm. when he asked them to consider the lives of those who live by faith. Yeah. And yet they were not, like everybody else was unworthy of them. Like mm. These were the high ones. So it's like a consideration. So it's not just merely, hey, it's all going to end up well. It's like, no, this walk of faith, this walk of faith is the greatest thing ever, but it's weighty. Hmm. So how do we, like those of us who are in uh, privileged situation, I mean, we're, we're in the United States, we're on a, a tropical paradise, mm-hmm. you know, our lived experience is quite far from those who have spoken the word of God in this context, mm-hmm. as far as like those who have suffered. Mm-hmm. Not to say that our lives don't have some mm-hmm. suffering, but it's certainly nothing compared to 
this? Mm -hmm. How are we meant to, I don't know, uh, interpret this, understand this? Because on one hand, what I've seen people in the church do is that they then start to manufacture or look for persecution when it's like, dude, just because someone said, I don't believe in Jesus to your face when you try to hand them a, 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 a glow tract or whatever, that wasn't persecution. I mm -hmm. promise you, you're mm -hmm. still okay. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we start to have a, a, almost like a victim mentality looking for, air quotes, persecution so that we can validate, oh, yeah, yeah, we are living in the, this kind of experience. But our, our lived experience is so far from the standard that's painted in Hebrews 11 and, and the rest of this. Yeah, so consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood. Mm -hmm. Sit down. Calm mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? So when we're manufacturing that sort of persecuted sure. posture, of like, I went and they cussed me out. Did you spill blood? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. But what I'm, what I, I, I get that point. But I guess the question I'm actually is asked, trying to ask, and maybe I'm doing a poor job of this. I'm trying to ask a different question. In that, because we aren't spilling blood, because uh -huh. we aren't like actually suffering in a meaningful sense, uh -huh. but this is the expectation of Scripture, seemingly. Uh -huh. What oh, do we make of that? Yeah, I would, I would reframe that because I don't think that. I think all human life is suffering, <laughs> sure. one way or another, hmm. and. I think there's very real physical suffering that people go through. There's very real economic hardships that people endure, right? But I, I don't want to discount. Like for instance, I was thinking about King Charles now. It's no longer Prince Charles, King Charles. Sure. Right? King Charles, he, there's uh, popular videos going around of him waving off servants. And oh, no. Have you seen this video? No, I have not. He's like waving off servants and... He's dealing with this inky pen that's like really just that, like spilling all over. You see the frustration emerging, right? It's like God gives his toughest war battles to his strongest warriors. Right? It's kind of something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah. the idea. Right. But, you know, you have this guy who's so unbelievably privileged. Sure. The living was literally born with a silver spoon, right? And he's having this, he's now the king, King Charles, and he's frustrated and flustered that there is a. A, 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 an ornament on this table that's in his way from signing something. He's just like waving off. Right? That brother is having a psychological experience where he's actually frustrated about something. <laughs> right? That frustration to somebody who's trying to pay their rent and about the suffering and eviction, we would say, oh, like one pales in comparison of the other. Sure. Right? But I think right there, is the point that to some degree from the vantage point of those who are experiencing it, it is the form of they're enduring something that they'd rather not endure. One seems a trivial discomfort. The other one is more real from an observer, for, but from the one who's really experiencing it, it's like, ah, oh, right? So, so the, the point of the gospel is all of it is trivial. All of it is trivial. <laughs> like compared to what Jesus has done, it's, we are all Prince Tr Charles, yeah. King Charles, yeah, and the things that we're experiencing in this life are the ornament in our way, yeah. And God, God's like, like, okay, I'm sympathetic because I've it. been tempted in all points because I went there with you, but now you, you have, have not suffered to the point of blood, exactly. So sit down. So we're all Prince Charles in a way. Where it's interesting. Like, hey man, like, stop waving them off. Hmm. Like, sit there, be at peace, wait, hmm. because there is actually a servant who's going to come and remove this ornament. And be thankful hmm. that you actually have somebody who serves you. Yeah, because that's a paradigm. Posture. Yeah, that's a paradigm shift. I think that's the point. Huh. It was Paul, he's like, y'all see how much I get beat? He's like, and I'm good. <laughs> and I've learned the secret of being content. And so I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so therefore, if your challenge is, dang it, man, we have visitors and we only have one loaf of bread left, like Give it to him. Like, relax. It'll be all right. Right? Or if your challenge is, I'm in this lion's den about to get eaten by these lions. Dang. That is a hard word. Be at peace. I mean, it's a hard word in the sense like, dang, that's a solemn word. Yeah. And then it also gives me a little bit of grace hmm. to King Charles. Like, the brother's there like, 
because you can quickly be like this privileged person. Sure. Yo, but if you're accustomed to having a servant constantly move every single ornament out of your way, and then at the biggest moment of your life when you actually become king, you've been <laughs> waiting 73 years, sure. and it finally happens, and now that ornament is still there. Think mm. about the way your mind actually uh, processes that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can relativize that all the way down because yeah. somebody inevitably always has it worse than you. Mm. Oh, well, you don't have it as bad as me. I am a... Well, you know what it is for in my house? What? And this is to uh, the previous conversation you and I have been having prior to, to microphones going on. But a stupid thing is like, you know, we got one of those soda stream things mm -hmm. now. I told you about this earlier, mm -hmm. how we've been drinking like stupid amounts mm -hmm. of bubbly or uh what's it called um carbonated la la lacroix or whatever yeah. the case is and we're like man you know what maybe for the environment maybe for our own sanity let's get one of those things that you push the button and it puts the gas into the water and you flavor it yourself mm -hmm. a source of frustration is when emily consumes the last drip in the <laughs> bottle and doesn't refill it and doesn't rebubble it so that way there's a cold one tomorrow morning. And you get there and, I'm and like, it's just not there. Woe is me. And like I, I internalize it as though it's an actual slight. Yeah. And there you are. You're King Charles. I'm King Charles. Waving doing, it off. Oh my lord. That's the point. Let love Bro continue. Let brotherly love continue. Hmm. Like consider, consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. Consider the outcome of their way. They, I mean, the, the the martyrs, man. When you think about the martys, you to, like read John uh, Fox's Fox book, book of Martyrs. martyrs right? Yeah, the yeah. second time I've heard the reference this week, someone else oh, had mentioned it. Bro, it is a wild book. It is so. Oh man, if something I read it in high school, stir your faith up. <laughs> These people walked confidently, to, and they called it their victory. Yeah, like they went to the stake singing praises to God, like, "Ooh, we have the privilege of suffering for Him. What an honor!" Wow. You imagine if that was our posture. <laughs> As I call my soda stream. <laughs> I've been suffering. So people that went to their death, how did they see it? Yeah. As the privilege of their lives mm. to suffer well for the Lord. Count it joy when you endure diverse <laughs> temptations. You, even if it's something as stupid as the soda stream. Yeah, we gotta the, we gotta have a change of perspective. Yeah, man. So I let let brotherly love continue. Jesus hmm. is Lord. Amen.